So here we are at the last part of the equilibrium vodcast for AP Chemistry. Uh, this last concept I hope will be just a review for you and easy to understand, and it has to do with Le Chatelier's principle, which formally stated says, if a system at equilibrium is subjected to stress, and the stress could be temperature, pressure, or concentration changes, then the system will shift its equilibrium in such a way so as to relieve the stress or to counteract the effect of the disturbance. That's a lot of words. I think if you start to see some of the examples here, it'll come back to you. Here is kind of an expanded version of that famous Haber process where we can take nitrogen gas from the atmosphere, which is what made this process unique, combine it with hydrogen under the right temperature and pressure conditions, and make ammonia. And they're saying here that it's used to make ammonia-based fertilizers. It's also the food stuff or feed stuff for the starting point for the making of bombs. And I've told my class this story many times that when we had to no longer rely on animal manures to make high uh, explosives in World War, let's see, one, I believe, it was estimated that the creation of the Haber process extended the pain and suffering of World War I by about two years longer than it should have because it made it much easier to make ammonia, which is the starting off point for a lot of explosives. So when you look at this particular system they're describing here for the Haber process, you can see what happens when you're already at equilibrium, lines are flat. The partial pressures of reactants and products are staying constant because you've reached equilibrium. But now somebody comes along here and at this point in time spikes it by adding a little hydrogen. Well, the system has to respond with a decrease in some reactants and an increase in others or products until eventually all three lines go flat again and you've established a new equilibrium. So by this particular picture, if I give you more hydrogen, it's as if the equation has its own personality and says, oh, thank you very much for that extra hydrogen. I'm going to eat up some nitrogen as I rush to the right to make more ammonia to try to reestablish my equilibrium. So that's why you're seeing the ammonia increasing in its spike here. This is the initial spike of the hydrogen that was added. So we kind of ignore that and look at how the an amount of nitrogen has decreased in response to that stress. We changed the concentration. This is the actual Haber process, and what you can do in the Haber process, as you can see, is it's reacting here at very high temperatures, and it's also being compressed, so it has to be under certain pressures. I'm not exactly sure what those are, but you can keep driving the equilibrium to the right, continuing to make more of your money maker, ammonia, by removing ammonia as it comes out of the system as a liquid. And that'll keep driving your reaction to produce more product because you're removing something. So let's see if you remember, and I think I need to back up to show you that on the equation, so let's go ahead and do that. If you increase the concentration of a reactant on the left, and that should really be a double-headed arrow there, then that's providing more raw material to make more product, it drives to the right. If you should suddenly dump in some more NH3, the system senses that there's too much NH3, and it drives back to the left side again to try to remove that ammonia that you spiked it with. So adding to the left, drives right, adding to the right, drives left. And when I say adding, I mean increasing concentration. Remember in a container, there is no left or right side, but we're just representing it by using the reactant side of the uh, equation and the product side. And yes, this is a reversible reaction, but we're still going to call the things on the left reactants and the things on the right products. Now here is another lovely equilibrium situation which shows you the impact of temperature on equilibrium. And this one is nice to see because it's got pretty colors. So the colors that you're seeing, and we'll learn about these in the spring, you can have cobalt ions with a bunch of water attached to it, and they look pink. You can also have cobalt ions with just four chlorides attached to them, and they look blue. So as I said, there's no side to a beaker. And essentially what happens is if you have a fairly even mix of the pink and the blue versions of this cobalt complex ion, it looks kind of purpley. 
But if you can do something to drive the equation to make more of the blue COCl4 ions dominate, your eyeball sees blue, recognize that there's still some of that cobalt with the six waters attached. It's just that the pink color of a few cobalt ions with water are dominated by the blue color of the COCl4 ion. Finally, and notice in this beaker, it's got ice floating around in it. So what you can do in this particular beaker is as you chill it down, it seems to be driving the equilibrium to favor the formation of the pink version of the cobalt ion, the cobalt with the six waters attached. There's still an occasional blue COCl4 in there, but I can tell which way it's shifting because of the pink color. So this particular picture right here, where pink dominates, that's the cobalt with the six waters, must mean you've done something to drive the equilibrium temporarily to the left until a new equilibrium is established. And the middle picture, showing predominantly blue COCl4 ions dominating, well, you must have been driving the equilibrium to the right. Now, you can tell what they did on the temperature if you just sit back and take a look at it. Adding something to the left concentration-wise drove to the right. Adding or increasing concentration of a product on the right drives your equilibrium back to the left, favoring reactants. I forgot to mention that removing a reactant from the left or from the right has the opposite effect. So removing or reducing concentration of substances on the left, it's as if the right-hand side senses, hey, some mean person took away, say, this cobalt complex ion. I better hurry up and drive back to the left to turn into that cobalt with the six waters attached to try to replace what that nasty mean person has removed. So if you kind of put a personality to it, summarize it by this. Adding to the left drives right, adding to the right drives left. Removing or decreasing concentration from the left drives to the left, and removing or decreasing concentration from the right drives to the right. So what you can do in this context is think of heat either as being on the left side as a reactant or on the right side as a product. If heat is written into the equation on the left, it's endothermic. It needs heat to drive to the right. If heat is written on the right-hand side of the equation, you can envision that equation or reaction as exothermic. It's producing heat. But the rules still apply if you pretend that that heat is a reactant or product. Adding heat on the right to an exothermic reaction, where the heat is already written in on the right, drives it back to the left. If you have an endothermic reaction, that means heat is written over here on the left-hand side. Giving it heat drives it to the right. That's what endothermic reactions want you to do. They need some heat to drive to the right to make more product. So in this particular picture, where I see that the chilling of the beaker seems to be favoring the pink version of the cobalt with six waters attached, that must mean that I'm driving back to the left. So adding ice into it is essentially removing heat. Let's think of it the other way. If the heat was being removed, and we assume this is endothermic, removing heat means removing something from the left, means you drive to the left, means my eyeball sees mostly pink. Now let's look at it from the other direction. If you added heat, let's still assume it's endothermic, if I added heat to this equation here, what you're going to see is the heat normally written on the left-hand side for an endothermic reaction. If I give it heat, it should drive to the right, and I should see the, excuse me, the blue form of the cobalt COCl4 predominating, and that's what's here in the middle picture. So I would say that this reaction must be endothermic because adding heat drives it to the right, Removing heat drives it to the left, and the only situation that could fit is if the heat had been written right there as if it was a reactant on the left-hand side. Now you can use the Chatelier's principle to predict these shifts pretty easily. Let's do a quick rundown and see how we do. Okay, so if I add some N2O4, 
That means I'm adding to the left. For a moment, jot down which way do you think that should shift. If I removed some NO2 on the right-hand side, remember removing from a side drives it to that side. Remember, no side in a beaker, though. We're only talking about sides on the equation itself. If I add something that has nothing to do with the reaction, I'm not so sure it's going to have any impact on equilibrium. They did tell me that the volume is increased in section D. Well, increasing the volume should decrease the pressure. And that's one of the Le Chatelier's stressors that we haven't talked about yet. When all of the reactants and products are gases, if you increase pressure, then you're going to drive it to whichever side has the fewest molecules. So if at looking at this N2O4NO2 equilibrium, increasing the pressure should drive it back to the left. It's almost like a thinking I squeeze the NO2 molecules so close to each other, they combine and they make N2O4. Removing pressure will drive it to whichever side has the greatest number of molecules. And one of the ways that you can remove or reduce pressure is to make it in a bigger container. So think about your answer to part D. Finally, before you can ever answer a question about the impact of temperature, you have to identify if this reaction is endo or exothermic. No negative sign there. That means it must be endothermic. Heat would be on the left-hand side. Decreasing the temperature is the same as saying, I removed heat. Things got colder. So if I'm removing heat, which is already written on the left-hand side, it should drive to that side. Let's see how we did. Part A, the system is going to shift to the right. We added N2O4. It says, thank you very much for that raw material. I'll go make more NO2. Part B, we removed NO2. So it says, oh, someone took away some NO2. I better hurry up and drive to that side to replace the NO2 that somebody removed. Equilibrium shifted right. Adding nitrogen is going to increase the total pressure of the system, but it's not in that equation. So it increases the pressure on both of those substances, and it should have no impact on the equilibrium position. If I increase volume, I will decrease pressure, which means the system will shift in the direction that has more gas molecules. That should be driving to the right, and sure enough, that is correct. And finally, since it's an endothermic reaction, decreasing heat should drive it to the left-hand side because that is where heat is written. Removing something from the left side drives it to that left side. So I hope that gives you a feeling for how to deal with the Le Chatelier's principle. Now this last problem, I'm not going to go through in great detail because the part here under the solution is something we haven't reviewed in a while. But you learned it last year. You could find the delta H for this reaction by taking heat of the products minus the sum of the heat of the reactants. That's what they've done here. And so we haven't done that. This is chapter 15. It assumes you've already done a couple of chapters on thermo. So don't worry that you wouldn't know necessarily how to jump into this problem. But now that we know that it's exothermic, we would understand that exothermic means heat should be written on the right. If I added extra heat, that means adding something to the right-hand side of an equation drives you back to the left. If I stood there and removed some heat by chilling it down, the left-hand side kicks into gear and drives more towards the right. But this particular problem I'm not too worried about right now, as long as you understand the impact of temperature on the equilibrium constant and the position, excuse me. So let's let that guy go and wrap up the chapter. On catalysts, when you look at the reaction pathway for any type of reaction, they sort of slip this in here, and I probably would have put this in with, say, um, the uh, uh, reaction kinetics chapter. But if you do add a catalyst to a reaction, it increases the rate both going forward and to the reverse. What impact it has is that the activation energy and this would be the activation energy going in the forward direction. It's from wherever you start on the energy content axis to the top of your so-called energy hill. That represents 
that when particles collide, how much energy they have to collide with to have an effective collision, to actually smack hard enough into each other to have a reaction occur. Well, when you add a catalyst, whether you're looking from left to right in a forward direction or right back to left in the reverse, it decreases the height of your energy hill. It gives you an easier pathway for two molecules to bump into each other or atoms and have an effective collision. And many times it simply improves the position, the angle at which molecules bump into each other. So if you use a catalyst, essentially the only impact it has is that you reach equilibrium sooner. But those levels of concentration on this equilibrium pathway won't be any different than you had seen previously, so you'll just reach equilibrium sooner. That's it. We're done with our five vodcasts for our equilibrium chapter. I hope you enjoyed them. Take care, and I'll see you next time.